Hi, and welcome to today's Biznology Digital Marketing Webinar. I'm Chris Abraham, one of the bloggers at Biznology. I'm Director of Social Media at Unison Agency, an integrated brand agency combining strategic, creative, and technology services to help their clients, our clients, build and strengthen our brand. I focus on blogger outreach, blogger engagement, and internet crisis response. I'm also founder and principal of Garris Digital, a full-service digital strategy consulting firm. Today you'll be hearing from Jennifer Evans Cario, author, speaker, and social media strategist, who will present Pinterest Marketing 101. But before we do, we need to recognize our sponsors, Barn Raisers, a digital marketing and social media solutions company that builds brands using community and the proven principles of relationship marketing. Brick Marketing, full-service SEO solutions company that increases website visitors. Marketing Pilgrim, the internet and social media marketing news blog. We cut through the bull so you don't have to. Sugar Spun Marketing, sustain, uh, sustainable social media strategies and analytics tailored around your brand's business level goals. And Unison, the unagency, your secret weapon in the noisy world of 21st century brand communications. As we wait for more attendees to join, let me review the format of our webinar. Our Biznology webinars last just 30 minutes, so you can easily fit them into your busy schedule. We record each webinar and we'll email you that link later this week. During our speaker's presentation, you can go to go to webinar controls to ask a question. That orange arrow opens and closes your webinar controls. If you have a question, simply type it in the box labeled questions at any time during the event and press the send button. I will select a few questions at the end of our webinar and pose them to Jennifer. While we're waiting for a, last, uh, a few last attendees to join, I'd like to remind you that the Biznology newsletter and blog are available for free at biznology.com. So if you're not already a subscriber, we hope that you'll sign up now. And as a shameless self-promotion, today my blog post came out, so please check it out. Thanks again to all of you for spending 30 minutes with us. I personally know that I'm pretty excited about seeing this, uh, this presentation myself. We know how valuable your time is, so let's introduce today's speaker. Jennifer Evans Cario is the president of Sugar Spun, Sugar Spun Marketing and the author of Pinterest Marketing, An Hour a Day. She also serves as the social media faculty chair for MarketMotive.com, the leader in web-based online marketing training. Uh, first, we're going to go ahead and take a quick poll. Um, which is to say, are you currently using Pinterest in your social media marketing plan? Um, please, or no. And uh, now, uh, so if you've ever struggled with how to use Pinterest for your marketing, this is the webinar for you. Jennifer, take it away. Thanks, Chris, and uh, thanks to everyone for uh, having me in for, for this webinar, for the chance to come in and talk about Pinterest. This is definitely a topic that is of a great amount of interest to a lot of people in the marketing and the social media world right now. But one of the questions that I want to ask even before we dive into this too heavily is to look at the idea of what is Pinterest. Because I can see that the greatest majority of the people who are on the call right now aren't already using Pinterest as part of their social media strategy. And I think that's the biggest thing that companies are trying to figure out right now is, okay, we know people are interested in this, we know there's a lot of people talking about this, but what can we we do to look at how we can actually integrate Pinterest into our marketing strategy, figure out how we can make it work for us. So I can get my slides to pop up on the screen, then I'd be happy to head in and, okay, there we go, and uh, start talking to you a little bit about it. I find the best way to help people understand Pinterest is to put it in the context of something that they already understand and they're already familiar with. So whether or not you're using Facebook as part of your marketing, most people who are involved in the web or any level of social media today have at least used Facebook on the personal level and they sort of understand a little bit about how it's used and how consumers interact with it. So when we look at some of the data that comes out from these two sites, we see a pretty big discrepancy in terms of average time on site. Facebook is by far the leader of any place on the internet with an average time on site per month of seven hours, whereas Pinterest has about 90 minutes. Now for some people, they're gonna look at those numbers and say, well clearly, 
there's more value in Facebook because people are spending more time there. But that's why it's important to understand the difference in how people are using these two sites. See, Facebook is viewed is a destination. It's a place where you go to connect with your friends, with your family, you know, your long lost college buddies, to have a conversation and to basically share the experiences and the ideas and the things you enjoy in your life. So it's sort of like going to a party and connecting with people, you know, the perpetual school reunion or family reunion. Pinterest, on the other hand, is viewed more as a starting point. It's a collection rather than a conversation. It's people's opportunity to say, here are the different ideas and how-tos and inspirational you know, concepts that I have found and collected together for me and for people that I'm interested in sharing my access with. So it's viewed as an inspiration platform. And that's where we see that difference in the time on site coming into play. Because people have Facebook as a destination where they want to spend time and really go deep with people, they do spend a lot of time on the site itself. Pinterest, we need to view more in the context of you know, a library or Google search or the magazine that you flip through where you're sitting in the doctor's office. It's that starting point to launch imagination, to launch your ability to say, hey, I want to dig deeper on this topic and learn a little bit more about it. So whereas Facebook is great for engaging with your fans and keeping them engaged with you on an ongoing basis, Pinterest is a wonderful place to attract fans, whether that's attracting new fans who might not already know about the great content that you offer, or whether it's taking your existing fans and the existing people who interact with you and getting them to make the people they're connected with aware of your brand. So just a sort of a generalized idea of why we value Pinterest so much on the marketing front. Now the other question is, why are people making such a big fuss about it? We know Pinterest has been in the news you know, on a pretty regular basis for about the last year and a half, and companies are making a huge fuss from the marketing perspective. Well, it's important to understand that, that there are a lot of different ways that Pinterest really delivers. First off, it's the third most popular social network in the United States. In fact, it's a top 50 website for the entire world. And that's pretty impressive numbers for a site that in the grand scheme of things is only a couple of years old and has really only been out in the mainstream for a little more than a year. Growth-wise, it's the fastest growing social network ever. The only thing that comes close comparison-wise is going to be Google+, but because all of the existing members of Google who had you know Gmail accounts or anything else were counted as part of that number, it's the the numbers there are going to be a little bit skewed. So if we take original, new, and unique social networks and uh, put them up for comparison, it's even growing faster than Facebook did when Facebook came out. They continue to sustain a 10 to 20% month over month growth. And delivery wise, it's currently the fourth highest traffic source on the web. And for most sites, it delivers more traffic than Yahoo, Bing, and Twitter combined. So again, for sites that are content-based or have the ability to share really good content or create really good content as part of their marketing strategy, this is a top-tier deliverer in terms of marketing power and traffic power. Now, also, when we look at the effect that sites are getting off of Pinterest, we see that the numbers continue to grow and rise over time. For example, I did a panel um, just a couple months ago with the CEO of Pinfluencer, which is one of the companies that was tracking uh, Pinterest analytics and Pinterest data. And he said that from September of last year to January of this year, looking at the thousands of sites that they were tracking data to, they could track an increase in visits per pin of four times over, 400% increase. The revenue per pin was up 50% and the page views per pin was up 100%. So people are not only still pouring into Pinterest and using it, but as they get more comfortable with it and they rely on it more heavily, the value to individual websites continues to go up. Now when we look at this from the e-commerce perspective, the numbers are impressive. Comscore and Rich Relevance have released some data that we can go in and pull out find out that the average order coming in off of Pinterest is $180. Now when we compare that to Facebook at $80 and Twitter at $69, you start to see why especially within the e-commerce, and within the consumer versions of uh, marketing, Pinterest is really, really hitting big and capturing a lot of attention right now. Now on top of that, we want to look at things and ask ourselves, 
why do we want to jump at Pinterest? What is it about Pinterest that makes us want to get our specific business involved? There's a couple things we need to keep in mind. One, it plays off the impact of imagery. And right now, with social media starting to become so overwhelming, because there's so much text, there's so much content that's spreading around right now, images become a much faster and easier way to communicate with people. Think of the progression we've had of social media. We started out in the world of blog posts where people could come in and write these you know, great, thoughtful, you know, informative, long posts that people would sit down and digest and read. And then we kind of started to move into that world of you know, more sound bites and sound clips with Twitter and with Facebook. And now we have so much information pouring at us on a regular basis, it's really hard to sort out what's going to impact us and what we're interested in. So for those of you who are heavy Facebook users but might not have delved into Pinterest too much yet, you will have noticed on Facebook the influx of photos and images in your news stream and how much emphasis Facebook is putting on those images. The reason for that is because photos weigh heavily with us visually. It's much easier to digest a concept and to digest it quickly and thus people are very, very receptive to it. Also, Pinterest has a very low barrier to entry. It's up there with, I would say, Twitter in terms of your setup time. Five to ten minutes, you can have an account up and running. The interface is very simple and easy to use. You know, you can sit down and inside of a half hour, you can pretty much understand how to create your boards, how to pin content, how to repin content. And overall, there's minimal management that's required for a Pinterest account. Unlike Facebook or a blog where you have to be in there on a regular basis looking at what people are responding and their comments and what they're saying, Pinterest is a little more of a sort of a visual version of bookmarking where you're just collecting and sharing resources and or creating resources specifically for the Pinterest audience. So management wise it's going to be a little less intensive for you. Also we've got the option to come in as a curator versus a creator when we look at our content marketing. It gives you the chance to share a lot of content about specific topics or specific subsets of topics without flooding the stream. So when you consider that your Facebook followers, they may be interested in one specific topic that your business does or one specific product or type of product that your company offers. And the rest of people who follow you on Facebook, they might be interested in totally different product offerings. So you can't focus too heavily on any one without risking alienating those other users. But because Pinterest gives people the opportunity to come in and follow a specific pin board, as opposed to following your entire account, you have the opportunity to share a much higher volume of content without flooding their newsfeed or without flooding their Twitter feed and annoying them. And then finally, it offers that content segmentation that I was just talking about. You can target a wider range of consumers and curate deeply into the topic without worrying about offending people. If you're a party supply company, you can put up all the wedding related content you want because the people who are coming in to follow you for birthday information or you know, for fundraising event information, they don't care because they're not going to receive all your wedding content. And Pinterest is really the first major social network to give us the ability to go in and narrow the field of what we're delivering to people to that level and to that depth. In fact, blogs are pretty much the only other area of social media where people can come in and choose to follow just a specific stream of your content. So because it carries such a wide range of business potential, I want to focus in on five of them today and I want to walk us through those fairly quickly and then we can dig a little deeper into the question and answer. One I've already mentioned to a certain extent is the idea that it drives traffic. Pinterest is a huge traffic driver for any site that offers any level of good quality content. It's also a great place to generate loyalty because chances are no matter what you do, there are people within your target audience that are on Pinterest connecting with brands, connecting with ideas and inspiration. So if you can come in and become part of that, it's a great chance to build up that loyalty with them. It also gives you an opportunity to demonstrate product potential in a different way than what you're going to get off of, you know, just say, 
uh, Facebook or you know Twitter or some of the other areas. It also gives you the opportunity to understand consumers in a very different way than many of the other social channels, and that's one that I really want to dig a little deeper on. And then finally, it gives you a chance to establish brand personality. And this is why most companies got involved in social media in the first place it was that chance to create a personal connection with people and help them see the company as a as a brand, as sort of an emotional entity, rather than just you know a company that they're writing a check to or a company that they're handing their credit card over to. So putting Pinterest to work, when we look at things from the traffic potential, we see tons and tons and tons of great examples here. Almost any content-based site um, or any you know sort of high-end blog or news network, you're going to see a ton of traffic pouring into them. In fact, Martha Stewart Weddings says they get more traffic from Pinterest than they do from Facebook and Twitter combined, which is a pretty impressive number when you consider how many people are on Facebook and how many people are on Twitter. But what they're doing is making sure any content that they put up on the content site is perfectly fit for Pinterest. So when you have people going on Pinterest to plan their weddings, to plan events, to plan birthday parties, and you can give them this great visual content and great visual ideas and inspiration, and you can put the little pin it button right up there next to the Facebook like or the tweet it button, this is the place where they're going to share vast quantities of information. Because most people understand sort of the social nuances of you can't share every image you like to Facebook. People are going to get really annoyed and they're going to unfollow you. You can't tweet out every inspirational image you find, but you can save as many of them as you want into your Pinterest folder and you're not going to take anybody off. So it becomes a great place to keep and maintain access to all of this. And by doing that and getting those ideas out there and letting them spread to that Pinterest community, you have the opportunity for people to then discover it on the Pinterest side and click back into your site, become a you know, traffic visitor, and potentially click through to see the rest of the 26 items they have here under Rustic Country Wedding Ideas and pin some more of those, perpetuating the cycle even further. Now, the other thing that sites that are doing well on the traffic front um, are doing is they're not only putting their own content up there. Unfortunately, there are some large content networks, um, Better Homes and Gardens springs to mind. They pretty much treat Pinterest as an RSS feed. They only put their own content up, so you're not going to get anything new from following them on Pinterest that you wouldn't already get if you were on their site. The brands that are doing it well, like Mar Martha Stewart Weddings, they're curating content from their own site, but they're also curating content from other people's site. So now you have a reason to follow them on Pinterest as well as following them on Facebook or visiting the site on a regular basis because you're going to get even more information and even more ideas than you were already getting from the site. And that basically buys them the opportunity to put their own content in front of you on a regular basis as well. Now, the next idea I want to look at is the idea of generating loyalty. And I love that Constant Contact gives me such a great B2B example to put into this because they really, really do Pinterest well, as does HubSpot is another great one to go and look at. But they're basically using Pinterest to say, okay, we know who our target audience is. We know who's making the decisions to purchase from us, to use us. We want to help enable them in the things they need to do within their job. So they're doing some form of personal marketing. Uh, they've got a, a board that's their new email templates that every time they have a new email template that's available through Constant Contact, they're going to pin this. So people can go in and quickly look at them and say, hey, these are the ones I like or this gives me some good inspiration. And they can see you know, this is exactly what I'm going to get and how they want to build it into their marketing plan. But they've also got some other great boards, you know, mobile tips and facts, content marketing tips and facts that are not directly coming from the Constant Contact website, but are still relevant to their target audience. Because if you can enable that person who's making that buying decision to have even more information to justify the expense when they're going to the higher ups, you're going to win their favor. You're going to win loyalty from them. And they're going to appreciate the value of the information you're offering. So these are the same types of concepts that we were already putting to work on LinkedIn, on Facebook, you know, on our blogs. It just lets us take them to an even deeper step because, again, we can put more content into these feeds without the risk of alienating any of our particular users. 
Now, another great uh, example that I want to give you in terms of demonstrating, demonstrating product potential is Chobani. Chobani was one of the earliest brands to get on Pinterest. I mean, they, they were there within a couple months of the site opening, long before most marketers have even heard of it. And they were doing some wonderful things. You know, Chobani is a brand, they sell little cups of yogurt, right? So you go buy yogurt that you eat for breakfast, and poof, that's, that's the end of it, you know, or the yogurt that you eat for a snack. There's not much more to it than that. But Chobani has done a wonderful job of scaling up the potential sales by saying, no, that's not all we are. Here's everything you can do with Chobani. So they've done everything from using it to tell stories. You know, think of Subway and their Jared marketing campaign. You know, they've got some great examples where they're linking into blogs or to their own blog to give people's testimonies. They're showcasing the use. You know, they're saying, hey, here are the uh, recipes you can use to bake with Chobani. They're also highlighting fan submissions where fans say, hey, this is the recipe that I just put up on my site and I love to use Chobani when I'm baking. So they're giving people motivation to go out and share information about the brand by featuring it on the Pinterest board. That motivating exposure is a huge part of this. And Chobani actually went in and did a campaign where they found a bunch of different food bloggers in a bunch of different areas. They sent them all the new Chobani flavors and they encouraged them to experiment and come up with some recipes and share those recipes. And it gave them a ton of fodder that they could include on the Pinterest page that they didn't even, they didn't have to link to the Chobani website. You know, all these bloggers are getting these great links coming in from Chobani, but what, what people are landing on when they click on those is basically a really well done ad for Chobani saying here's exactly what you can make if you buy this product. I've seen tons of different companies implementing this strategy and doing it very, very well, including one example that I, I couldn't find because I can't remember the brand name, but there's actually a company that sells chainsaws that is doing a wonderful job of playing off the whole zombie thing, you know, the zombie theme with their Pinterest page using the chainsaws and the chainsaw sales and customer testimonials. Okay, so moving on um, to the idea of understanding consumers, because I think this is one of those ways that a lot of people are still missing the boat and seeing the value of Pinterest. Um, a great case study on this one is actually the site Daily Gromit. Daily Gromit will source um, unique, individual, you know, newly created products and sell them on the site. And they noticed at one point that a lot of people were pinning content off their site saying, hey, this is a great idea, this is a really amazing idea. So what they decided to do was actually put together a group pin board and to invite some of their, the Daily Gromit evangelists, you know, some of the people who are regular shoppers to come in and join this board and pin products that they found around the web that they would like to see featured on the Daily Gromit site. So by creating that group pin board, now they're letting their customers become part of the research center and part of the idea generation center. They also partnered up with Pinterest analytics company Curalate, which does a wonderful job of going in and tracking not just which images are being pinned, but actually breaking down the activity around it to give you a better idea of the interactions, the impressions, the traffic that's coming through even looking at which pinners are sending you the most traffic. Now, based on my conversations with uh, Daily Gromit, they had sourced six new products for the website since they started this approach, and they had seen a 446% increase in traffic in just two months from having this group board out there, having people become part of this process, and letting people feel like they were owning what was happening on Daily Gromit. Now, establishing a brand personality, for those of you who are familiar with blog marketing or you know, even to some extent Facebook marketing, this isn't going to be a big stretch for you. It's the idea of creating supportive content. You know, if you're REI, that's going to be travel tips, you know, things about extreme sports. But it's also getting in front of them while they're doing what they do. So for REI to become part of Pinterest where people are researching camping trips and looking for backpacking tips and all sorts of other things, it's a great opportunity to be where they are and to get in front of them. But it's also a chance to share knowledge and to do it in an interesting way. So REI puts out all sorts of great infographics that are actually part of their sales process but are also useful in information. So you know, what capacity backpack do I need based on the length of my trip? Or my favorite, 
the 13 essential zombie survival gear. And guess what? REI sells pretty much all of those products, but it's still a great image. It's amusing. It's interesting. It plays off pop culture. And it's the type of thing that spreads really well and helps push your brand really well on a site like Pinterest. Now, I mentioned earlier, there's sort of a two-pronged approach to Pinterest. The idea that you can create or you can curate. And that's one of those things that people really need to understand the difference here. You know, when we're talking about a blog or we're even to some extent talking about, you know, Facebook and Twitter, it's about creating content of value to put out there. Now, you can have a very successful strategy by curating other people's content and only putting a small amount of your own content in. Some of that just depends on the size staff you have, you know, how much ability you have to create that content, and what you're looking to achieve with your brand. But that is one of the things that makes this nice is, I guess it is similar to Twitter in that way, where the majority of content you put out can basically be a rehash or a collection of content that other people have produced. So real quick, I want to go through uh, four quick and easy ways to change up your Pinterest strategy so we can jump over into the Q&A pretty quickly. Uh, the first one is segmenting your content. I mentioned that earlier. You need to make sure that you are looking at your content marketing plan as a whole and you're figuring out what types of content are going to play with people. And then create topical boards because people will have the ability to come in and follow some of them or all of them. So your followers can basically create a customized feed. So you want to make sure you're taking advantage of that segmentation ability. Also the ability to organize your pin boards. You can go in and drag and drop them to different locations. So if you're hitting um, Labor Day and you've just finished Labor Day, it's a good idea to take your Halloween content and move it up. If it's coming into spring, you know, and you're me, you want to move some homesteading or farming the farm type content up. You know, if you're doing a special promotion or an annual event, you want to move that content up and down based on what's relevant at any point in time. Because when people come in and land on your brand page, they may only scroll through the first couple dozen pin boards that you have. So if you have a bunch of outdated content, you know, if it's March and you're still showing Christmas and New Year's and Valentine's Day, it kind of looks like you're not paying proper attention to your board. So make sure you're getting in and organizing your pin boards um, to give people you know, that good visual impact as soon as they come in on your site. And then also revamping the default Pinterest description. Um, the alt attribute for your image is what it will feed in to the pin it board or to the uh, pin it description tag if you've created it. If you haven't put an alt attribute in, it's going to pick up the title tag of the web page. You definitely don't want to have it do that if you've got the ability to come in and give something that people are more likely to leave there and that gives people a reason to click through to view the, uh, the website that you're putting out there. Also, choose your images and descriptions wisely. I see far too many people putting up the full value of the post right in the image itself. So we look at the one on the left, the easiest fudge ever, the entire ingredients and directions are right there. Why would I ever click on that to go? I'm going to pin the post, I'm going to save it, but I'm never going to click through. Whereas the image on the right still gives me that motivation of saying, hey, this is a two ingredient recipe and it actually looks pretty tasty. Okay, now I need to click on it to go through to the site. So make sure you're not giving them so much information in your image that they have no reason to come in and see you. And then also, Choose images that help people relate to the final project. So there was a period in time where this idea of uh, refurbished furniture turned into children's kitchens was really big on Pinterest. Well, the image on the right is great in that they made it out of a TV stand and a cabinet, but I don't know that looking at the description of do-it-yourself children's kitchen. I might go, wow, that looks like way too much work for me. But on the other hand, when I look at this image on the left and I see this was a TV stand that they basically painted and put some curtains on, suddenly that's relatable to me. And I go, oh, I could actually do something like that. I'm going to be much more likely to save that one and click on that one and interact with that one. And then finally, make sure that you're when possible, that you're overlaying a text description on your image itself, because this gives you some protection off of what people write as the description for the image. You want people to know what they're going to get when they come through. So that image on the right, it doesn't tell me what I'm going to get other than you know, generic camping tips. The image on the left, 35 camping trips 
tricks, you know, do it yourself, recipes, remedies, that is much more specific and I have much more reason to both save the image and click through to the image. So thank you so much for, uh, for sticking with me through that half hour or so. I'm going to turn it back over to Chris um, to get into Q&A and I think one more poll. Thanks Jennifer. I'm sure attendees have a much stronger idea of how to use Pinterest in their marketing. Um, but you didn't answer every question. We'll get to that in a second. First, I uh, would like to do uh, uh, another poll. Um, uh, what's your biggest obstacle to using Pinterest? And uh, you're going to have a long time to ponder and think about this because um, I've got several good questions uh, from our audience to feed up to you, but I don't have enough. So I'd like to remind our audience that it's not too late to ask your own question by typing into the questions box uh, in your GoToWebinar control. Um, and before we get to the answers of this poll and to the answers to, this que to the questions from Jennifer, um, we need to thank our sponsors once again. Barn Razors, a digital marketing and social media solutions company that builds brands using community and the proven principles of relationship marketing. Brick Marketing, full service SEO solutions company that increases website visitors. Marketing Pilgrim, the internet and social media marketing news blog. We cut through the bowl so you don't have to. Sugar Spun Marketing, sustainable social media strategies and analytics tailored around your brand's business level goals. And Unison, the unagency, your secret weapon in the noisy world of 21st century brand communication. Now to the answers to the poll. Excellent. Uh, and on to the questions. Okay, let me see about these questions here. Um, first question, Jennifer. Any results carrying through to spending and not just traffic? Uh, yes, we we had a slide earlier um, in the in the presentation where we were talking about when people do buy, the average sales that are coming out of Pinterest are about double what's coming out of uh, Facebook, and are probably about one and a half times as much as what we're seeing out of Twitter. Um, but some of that makes perfect sense when you think about the target audience that's in each of those locations. Again, when you go to Facebook, most people are going to Facebook to connect with friends and relatives and to share information on a personal level. People are going to Twitter usually to gather news or to sort of see what the topic of the day is. They're going to Pinterest for inspiration and ideas and a lot of times that's going to lead to a purchase. Excellent. Is there a suggested number of boards or range that work best with a Pinterest account, Jennifer? Um, no, there's really not. I've seen brands do it very well with a dozen boards. I've seen brands do it really well with 120 boards. A lot of it's going to depend on sort of growing naturally based on the volume of content you have in any specific board. I think anytime you can go through a board and say, you know what, within the topic X, there's a lot of topic Y, you know, in the subset. In fact, there's enough of topic Y that let's pull that out and make it its own topic. So if you were doing a board on mobile marketing and you found out you had a lot of pins in that board that were specifically on, you know, iPhone apps, then you might want to pull that out and do an iPhone app marketing board. And it also seems like I really love what you said about bringing the most relevant uh, germane ones to the top of the, of the set. Oh yeah, absolutely, and I think anyway. that's that's something yeah. <laughs> a lot of that's something a lot of people don't get around to doing. And honestly, just going in once a month and looking and saying, what do I need to shuffle around here, and you know, doing some tracking to see what the number of followers are for each board, because we track each individual board to see are the follower numbers going up and down. And when we move things seasonally, we definitely see a larger increase than if we kind of leave them hidden. I just looked at my blog and Pinterest is my number four uh, traffic generator. But okay. believe it or not, stumble upon stumble upon is my number third, and I keep on forgetting that stumble upon exists. Yes. Um, <laughs> um, another question. Can you share some examples of B2B companies using Pinterest? Uh, well, Constant Contact that I put in there is one of my favorite examples, but I think going in and looking at HubSpot is a great example. HubSpot does a really great job of getting infographics and white papers and studies and some data up for that one. Um, let's see, well, I had another B2B one in the back of my head. Um, 
On the informational B2B side, uh, Marketing Land does a great job, uh, so does Mashable. Um, but usually what we're seeing right now on Pinterest is sort of the service-based companies. You know, so obviously you're going to have internet marketers, you're going to have tech marketers. We're still seeing a little bit more you know, slow adoption in some of the rest of the B2B world. So like if you're selling flow meters, Pinterest probably isn't the best place for you, and I'm probably going to tell you you shouldn't be there right now. Um, but if you're doing something where a content marketing strategy on your blog has shown some promise, I think there's some natural space to move into Pinterest as well. Do you have any idea when Pinterest will release its API so that it can be managed <laughs> on a site like Hootsuite? <laughs> um, whenever they darn well feel like it is unfortunately what seems to be the answer. We have to remember Pinterest still has a really small staff. I think last time I looked, I think they're still under two dozen people. And for the size of what they've grown into, you know, that's, that's not a lot of people to handle that much work. So they'll get to it, but I think right now they're still also so focused on how do we monetize this that it just hasn't been a real you know, it's not been a real big priority for them. I think they want to avoid what happened to Twitter where they release the API and then they end up drawing it way back down the road because they have to to be able to proper, properly monetize the site. So I think we'll probably still see a delay of maybe another six months or a year. Uh, is Pinterest a good option for an independent business that doesn't have a web store? Um, Unless you're using a your website for, say, lead generation, then I'd say no. If you don't have some place that you own to send them to, then I wouldn't worry about Pinterest because, I mean, you're gonna, you can build up loyalty and people can like you, but you're not going to have any bottom you know, line value to your company if you can't use it to funnel them into some place where you can monetize them. How do you pick content to get started and drive sales? How do you track results to see what's performing best? Well, tracking results to see what's performing best is just going to be part of your standard analytics package. You know, figuring out first what do you want people to do and then sitting down and saying, okay, what type of content do I have to put together to get them to do that? So if I want to generate, you know, leads for my webinar business or if I want to generate leads for, you know, my training business, okay, I need to say, well, what type of training are people interested in and how much of a snippet of training do I need to provide them to get enough credibility to have them visit my site and sign up for something. So it's just like any other area of your social media goals. You have to figure out the end goal and then sort of reverse engineer to figure out what content's going to help reach that. Here's an interesting question, Jennifer. You know how you were saying how you can really, uh, really dump a lot of content into Pinterest without being perceived as spamming? Yes. Is there an equivalent of, um, here's the question, I'm sorry, um, what is the frequency do you recommend making changes to pinning? Is there a spamming equivalent in, equivalent in, in Pinterest? What is spamming in Pinterest? Uh, well, spamming in Pinterest is basically a, a bait and switch. Spamming in Pinterest is either going to be putting up content that doesn't actually lead to what you say it does, or it's going to be putting up content that is purely purely promotional. So I saw a brand once that on a daily basis posted the exact same ad for their website. That's going to be considered spamming. You know, anything that people don't find even a modicum of value in is going to be spamming. In terms of how much content you can put out there, I think some of that becomes part of a common sense mentality. I don't think I'd pin 100 items per day if I was a brand, but I also don't think I'd limit myself to two or three because there's going to be days where you find a lot of really great content and you want to put that content in there. Now right now, the Pinterest algorithm is still very, very immature. So one of the primary ways to get content from Pinterest is to have your pin get promoted to what's called the category page. Now, when you put a pin up on Pinterest and you put it in one of your boards, anyone who follows your board is going to see it in their feed. But occasionally, Pinterest will take one of those pins and they'll put it on the topical board for all of Pinterest, you know, so maybe like wedding and events or humor or travel. That's where you get the greatest amount of exposure and the greatest amount of traffic coming in. And it used to be every pin you made got promoted to that category board. Then when people started to spam the site, 
they kind of shut all that down. And for a while, it was the first pin every hour went up to the category board. Then it was the first pin of the day went up to the category board. Now it's some sort of weird randomized solution that almost nobody knows. So what we have to do is we have to look towards the future and say, if we're Pinterest, how would we logically value content? Because that's the exact same thing search engines have done. And we want to expect that Pinterest will eventually reach that point of valuing content the same way we do. So we want to look at things like having a large amount of followers, having the type of pinned content that people click on and that people repin, because that demonstrates to Pinterest that our content has value. And there's going to come a time where Pinterest is going to promote people into that category feed based on the demonstrated value of past content they've pinned. So with that in mind, I recommend people pin carefully. And as long as they're pinning carefully and pinning content they know their followers will like, to not worry about capping themselves. That's the very long answer to that one. So there's going to be a redification, a reddification yeah. a little bit. Yeah. So that's very interesting. Thank you very much. And I've been so into this that I've lost track of time. So <laughs> may I maximum full bus. Uh, so now I get to read my script. Well, that's all the time. <laughs> well, that's all the time we have for today. Thanks to Jennifer for these great ideas. And thanks especially to our audience for your awesome participation and your questions. If any of you had questions that we did not have time to answer, you can email your questions to Eileen at MikeMoranGroup.com, and she'll be sure to get them to Jennifer for the answer. Later this week, we'll send you all a link to the recording of this webinar to listen to again and to share with others. We also invite you to mark your calendars for our next Biznology webinar, Making Money from Website Search, scheduled for 11 a.m. U.S. Eastern Time on June 18th. And thank you very, very much for all of your attention and your time, everyone. And thank you, Jennifer.